I was still watching My Little Pony and I was like, this <laughs> blew my mind. Like maybe if I hadn't been shown the crow at age 11, I would be normal. <clears throat> Hi y'all, Snarky Jay Cosplay here. I've been wanting to make a video like this for a long, long time, and I could not be happier for how this all came together. So if you've spent any time watching this channel at all, you probably know that my biggest love, my favorite movie of all time, is The Crow from 1994. And I was recently given a gift, genuinely the greatest piece of content I've ever read in regards to The Crow. And I have the great pleasure today of having on the author of this book to talk about the movie and why it's important. Let's get into it. I have none other than Bridget Bass, who is the author of the single most complete piece of media, a book about The Crow. It's called The Crow, The Life, Death, and Rebirth of a Classic Film. Guys, this 100% is a recommend from me. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about the book and The Crow. So Bridget, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Totally my pleasure. <laughs> to be your first guest too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first the first guest on this channel, guys. So, I have been obsessed with the crow since I was 11 years old. It has been my greatest passion. So, coming from a crow fanatic, what is it that inspired you to write this book? Well, um it kind of happened by accident. So, there was an inspiration that happened after I sort of got the topic. So, I was a journalist in a, and a producer and an on-camera reporter for Sky News in the US and other news media and I had just gotten two of my shows canceled so I know that you know that it was I was it would happen it happened off and on so it was a New Year's Eve and this is in the book but it was a New Year's Eve uh, in 1999 so a while ago and I've been doing it for about five or six years and it was really good and then I was like oh my god I just need to find a new like show and a new like gig and it's good and a friend of mine, a friend of a friend was having dinner with us at this restaurant in Los Angeles and said, hey, you know, I publish a lot of like calendars and merch and stuff to do with The Crow. And, it, you know, the movie came out in 94. So and I had seen the movie because I went to UCLA film school. So I had seen it when I was in film school. And then I was I was shot. I was impressed, deep, very impressed. But I knew some people who had worked on it, but I, I didn't give it that much of a thought. And so he said, if you can, I, I, he had published a few books that were like unauthorized or biographies of, and the publisher who I was having to do it said, if you can find a story in it, I will publish it. And I said, okay. And, and I'll pay for it, all the expenses. I was like, what dream writer is like, oh, wow. Okay. And I had been a print journalist as well. So I was like, okay, well, this is a huge challenge. I'll see if there's a story. I was shocked at, so in 94, the, obviously the movie came out, but the accident obviously that killed Brandon Lee happened in 93. There was a criminal investigation and that ended fairly quickly within a year or two, but then there was civil litigation that happened. So, and, and people who worked on the film had to sign a non-disclosure agreement and they, they, you know, and be silent and not talk to the media. Plus the media initially when, the whole accident happened. Everybody had a distaste for the media. The media was like ugly and awful and this was a horrible tragedy. It was totally insensitive. But by 1999, everything had expired. So all these cases had settled. People were just kind of moving on with their lives, whatever they were doing, whether they were, even many of the people who worked on the film went on to win Oscars and, and make uh, some amazing people who got their start on The Crow. No one had approached them because it was a little bit of a forgotten story. So I came along and one person after another, I convinced, I'm like, really, I do not want to write a sensational book. I want to write a really good book about your story, about what happened on the movie. And I loved filmmaking because I went to film school, so I understood the art of filmmaking. And I really tried with the book to also encapsulate the groundbreaking filmmaking techniques that they used on The Crow, because to me, that was interesting, as well as obviously culminating in the tragedy. But the whole movie was groundbreaking in so many ways. And people, I gained people's trust along the way. So anyway, so then it became a real book. And then I was like, I am so invested in this. And people were saying, oh, I'm so glad somebody's telling our story. And it was timing. It was luck. It was, it was hard. <laughs> It was, it was great. It was, and that, so that was the first edition. And then this is the totally updated edition. I didn't expect to be writing the new edition even, but there's so much interest in The Crow and just sort of, 
I've gone on to do many other things in my life and people keep calling me. Now I'm kind of like, I'm the only person who put the entire story into a chronicle, into a kind of historical log by interviewing all these people and creating this journal of the movie's making. I knew the 30th anniversary was coming up. So it was kind of in the back of my mind. So I called a lot of the people who I interviewed in the first one, like, why is the Crow a phenomenon still? Why do new generations of fans care about this? Why are they making a new reimagining of the film? Yeah. <laughs> so um, it's really interesting because it, it's an yeah. evergreen story. So anyway, we can go on and stuff. But... No, it, it genuinely is one of those things. I mean, it's, it's funny because off topic, my dad had, obviously my dad watched it in theaters in 1994. I wasn't born until 2000. And I watched the movie for the first time in 2011. And it literally like has been my personality since like 2011. And he's still to this day. Why of all the things to care this much about, why The Crow? But do you think that telling the story, right? Like in the book, cause you, you literally encapsulate everything that happened like from from James O'Barr writing it, the production, you talk about the soundtrack, like every little thing, every little detail is encapsulated. Do you think that that's part of preserving both the film's legacy as filmmaking has changed and Brandon Lee's legacy? Because I think that some people might almost consider the movie for as underrated as it is, still overrated because it's it's easy to consider it a cult classic purely because it was affected by this tragedy. So do you think that telling a story like this in 300 or so pages, encapsulating everything, do you think that that's part of, of preserving the legacy and keeping it relevant? Well, that's thank you for the great question and thank you for reading the book too so carefully. <laughs> when I... I did not really want to, I, I was not a journalist or, or am not somebody who really enjoys sensational things. And yes, it's, it's hard to, the question that lots of people ask is like chicken and egg, like was the movie successful because of the tragedy and then the kind of lore around that in 1994 or still, or was it because it stands on its own? And I would guess I would argue it stands on its own. And I, as, a, as somebody who went to film school and someone who really appreciated all of the groundbreaking techniques and vision that they had in bringing this, in 1994, this movie was the first of its kind. I wanted to write something that would last the test of time and that would really be a chronicle of the movie itself, not just about sensational things and gossip and that was not what I wanted to be known for it's not what I enjoy because I remember when I went to film school I read um Blade Runner the making of Blade Runner and I love the movie right it was very influential in my sort of understanding film and I thought that is a fantastic masterpiece because it it really showed the entire process from the origin of the idea the getting you know the whole process of filming it and then i became friends with the producers of the crow jeff most who's an amazing amazing person and james obar i mean the idea starts with the germ of the idea and i really wanted to tell how we got and it was such a compelling story people would talk to me they're like oh we've never talked to anybody in this length i'm like i want to know your whole story and the story was so compelling i just to me it was interesting i wrote something i thought was interesting to me the the people who gave their blood, sweat and tears to do this very complicated film with a lot of ins and outs and a very, at the time, low considering what they were trying to do and all the mishaps that happened who were just dedicated to their art. And, and they kind of converted me, I guess, in a way to just tell their story. And the vision of the film, the film style, the film was the first of its kind in so many ways. It's all chronicled in the filmmaking of the book. So it's a little heavy on filmmaking. So people aren't really interested in like, but you sound like you are like, it's really how, you know, they develop new lighting techniques, and, you know, but, but I hope I made it interesting enough to be about the people doing it, not just about the technology or the tech or, you know, whatever. No, that, that actually is one of the things that I really liked about the book, because I think 
it's it's really tempting for journalists and for media in talking about this to just make it about the tragedy. And there's a lot of sensationalism, as you said, surrounding it. And there's a lot of really gross ways to talk about it that are increasingly unpleasant. And for me, I've always been interested in film because my dad is in video production, which is why I do this as well. <laughs> that makes um, sense. So for me, I thought it was fantastic because, like you said, The Crow is such a groundbreaking for its time. They developed so much, like, you know, when CGI was in its infancy, there's so much about that in this book. I mean, I had never, I never understood, um, one of the, one of the highlights for me when you wrote about how they did the hand, that fun boy shoots through his hand, like the fact that, uh, I'm not going to spoil it so that people will, will read the book, but I found that fascinating. There was so much in there because you really got a hold of like everybody. I was in shock. I mean, because I know how many people work on a film set. Was there anything that you would say was specifically like challenging about getting these stories? Because I mean, we're now, this is, this is the revisited version now 30 years after the release of the original. Was it, was it hard to get, you know, comments from folks? You mean now or previously? Well, at, at the start, I had to gain people's trust. Yeah. So I had to kind of figure out relationships I had because I had some, I, you know, I was in LA and in film and television production. So I kind of used a little leverage from people I knew to be like, oh yeah, Bridget's okay. She's like, you know, not okay. <laughs> um, but I gained, it just really was calling people and being very honest. Look, I have been commissioned to research whether there's a story in here. I genuinely, and I would say, just meet me, just meet me for coffee, just meet me at your studio or on your film set, uh, whatever you're doing. But there was a lot of skepticism from a, a lot of people too, or people, there was a, a, you know, different groups of people were like, oh, we're going to write our own book. This is 1999, you know, we're going to write our own book. We don't want you interfering with our like part of the pie. Nobody's ever written another book, which is what it is. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I've had lot, there were lots of discussions and lots of negotiation and some people were flat out, you know, hostile. And I did get, I mean, I don't really dwell on it, but I did get a couple of pretty threatening phone calls from people saying you should not write this book. I don't know who they were for, from. I, wow. I but that disappeared pretty quickly. And so the more people who I befriended, I'm like, and they're like, oh, we should talk to this person. And, oh, you should talk to that person. It took a while but I somehow got the book done in a year. So I pretty much dedicated myself to doing it. And it became like a kind of snowball effect, like more and more people. And then now returning to it, in fact, I just actually connected with Lawrence Mason, who was tinted <laughs> today. Yeah. Mean, all these people I've just, you know, reconnected with. And they, I mean, I haven't talked to them in a while, but a lot of people I have re-spoken re to, and there's some new anecdotes in the new edition of people who hadn't, who had been hesitant to speak initially because like filing what didn't, you know, because I think people wanted to distance themselves, mm -hmm. whether they were an actor or, you know, they, for various reasons, they wanted to distance themselves from it in 99. They were like, it, it, people are frightened about how it might badly reflect on their careers and their futures. Although not true with many of the people who spoke to me very like openly, like Claudio Miranda, the gaffer has gone on to win an Oscar. Like for cinematography, it's like amazing. Wow. For the life of Pi. I mean, and he was, so sharing or chad stahelski who was <laughs> oh my god yes i mean chad yes, stahelski the was director of john Wick's body double and friend from the dojo they went to and with jeff i mean all these people are like were friends of brandon they gave me the i mean they were genuine friends and then they trusted me with like talking about brandon person which i was deeply deeply honored by so it's it's been really a joy in that way but i wanted to with the new book talk to a lot of people who I hadn't spoken with, talk to a lot of people I had spoken with, and then new people about like, why is the crow, why does that story still resonate? And then kind of engage new generations. Like, what is it? Which maybe you might have something interesting. So I do have a question for you. So what was it when you were 11 that you were struck by that film? I'm, I'm really, I would have interviewed you for the book had I known. <laughs> so it's, it's interesting because 
The only reason I watched it, my mom loves showing me old, irrelevant movies. We were digging in a $5 bin at Best Buy, and she pulls out The Crow, and it was the, it's the Blu-ray, it's like a white cover, and it's just him in silhouette, and she goes, you love superhero crap, you would love this. And I remember I saw it, and I was like, I dig this guy's vibe. Okay, and she sat me down to watch it, and I think what really strikes me about it is not just obviously I'm kind of a creep, I'm a little weird, and you know, I dig his whole vibe and you know, just the poetic nature of him because it's clear that he's disturbed, but he's also sensitive and artistic, and I think that a big chunk of that is the fact that Brandon Lee brought a sensitivity to the character that really isn't super present in the original comics, because I've, I've read them, you know, front to back several times, and he is poetic, but he's far more on the side of deranged than Brandon was. And for me, I think it really just resonated with me as one of the greatest love stories ever told. Because yes, you can look at it like a vengeance mission, but it's all derived from this love between this man and this woman who were wrongly separated by death. And his love for her is so powerful that his soul is able to come back. Like that to me was the most romantic thing you could say. I was 11 years old, had no concept of love or what a relationship should look like. I was still watching My Little Pony and I was like, this <laughs> blew my mind. Like maybe if I hadn't been shown the crow at age 11, I would be normal. But <laughs> I'm so grateful for all the life lessons it taught me and, and I think it prepared me like just that single line. It can't rain all the time. That is my, my motto, my creed. I live by that. Life throws all kinds of challenges at you. It's not a bed of roses for any of us. And I think having that, it can't rain all the time. Like, it just echoed. And it was the way he delivered it where it felt like this was not an actor reading a line. This was somebody who believed this. This was just, it, it felt like it spoke to me directly, you know? And it was, it was released six years before I was even a twinkle in anybody's eye. And yet I was like, wow, it's probably the single piece of media that I've ever felt has spoken to me in a true way. And I think that a lot of people feel the same way. Yeah, I think that you just sort of said it. And, and the story is beautiful. And James O'Barr's germ of the idea, which, you know, came from a terrible personal tragedy, which I, I write about. And I guess that whole concept, that the whole thing, the thing you just spoke about and how powerful the story is, I guess looking back on my experience with writing the book and just speaking to people is I think that that magic and sometimes some people I've interviewed have used the word mythical, but it's, it is a mythical story is that, that love can transcend death and that good can overcome wrong and make the wrong things right, which is a line from the film. They, in, in the making of the movie, they really preserve that sort of world outside of the world atmosphere, which I think makes the movie magic in and of itself. And everyone was on board with that. So the spirit of the film, the spirit of the story, I think is what made people so give so much of themselves to make that movie. And that's what I learned is that people believed in it, especially, I unfortunately, I never met Brandon, um, but you know, all the people who knew him and the people who worked with him and the making of that movie was really permeated by the story itself, which is, I don't know, it's like you can't catch lightning in a bottle, but they kind of did a little they bit. They did. You know, the story itself is magical, right? I mean, it, it just, the movie captures that. Just writing, I was like, even writing it again or updating it, I was just like, this is exceptional. This is an exceptional part of history. And I happen to be part of it, which is awesome. Although not what I expected when I wrote the first edition. <laughs> but I was kind of honored. I'm like, oh, I have to do this. And I have to do it well. Anyway, so. Yes, it has a it has an evergreen kind of story about compassion and love and the human spirit and all those things that sound really stupid and cliche, but they're not because the way yeah. that the crow executes it is not 100% right. It's like the character is not a good guy. Well, it doesn't matter whether he's, a, it's not about being good or bad. It's about being human and the humanity that, yes, I agree. I mean, that's the magic of Brandon Lee's portrayal of it. It's just the nuance and the, I, I, I think everyone would feel like 
there was so much depth to what he brought to that. Yeah. And, and then all the other people who worked on it saw his commitment, because that's in the book too. So, so many people saw his deep commitment, but it just spread like to all the cast and crew that they just felt that depth of commitment, that depth of like, we are doing something really important that is really unique and it's, you know, it's contagious, I guess. Would you say then that that's what sets The Crow apart? Because it's obvious that, you know, the, the comic book movie basically became commonplace as of like 2011. I think you can't throw a rock in a movie theater without hitting a poster for six new Marvel and DC movies at any given time. And yet, for somebody who watches and consumes these, and the reason I got shown The Crow was because I was obsessed with all this other stuff, and yet I don't think there's a single piece of media that ever affected me or that I ever connected with to that extent. Would you say that, that, it's, that it's that, the fact that it's such a human story? Because it's not... It is fantastic, and it does have mythical elements, obviously. No, I don't, as far as I'm concerned, nobody has come back to, you know, from the dead to avenge themselves and, you know, done sick face paint for it. I don't know. But I, th I think it's, it, it has to be that, right? That human quality in, in the film and in his portrayal. I think the whole story permeates with all the characters kind of feed into that. And, and I think that that's what the producers also wanted in the, you know, the, the creative team is they wanted to create a really human story. So all the characters have some moments of, I mean, you know, Ernie Hudson's character is the police officer. I mean, he has his own, you learn about his trials, you learn about him, his personal life is not so great and he's a chain smoker and then he gives it up. And then, you know, Sarah, the character's story, I mean, she's, her mom is a, a heroin addict and it, just all the characters, even the bad guys, even the bad guys to a certain extent have some yeah. frailty. There was, just this level of, and it's to a credit to the producers and Alex Proyas for showing that, for giving that camera the time to really look at, and then the casting too. I mean, the casting is amazing. It's hard to contrast it with like Marvel or DC movie. It's really hard. It's, it's apples to oranges, to be it, honest. It's kind of, because it's a totally different movie. It is stylized in its own way. And I don't know what really would be similar to it. But I think that, that, that you know, they tried to really portray Oh, I think what's effective, and, and I know they tried, is to portray that even in this fake reality, where they live and this hellhole that they created, the individual people have meaning. And I, it was just magic, right? Yeah, I think, I think that that's lost in filmmaking, but <laughs> that's an entirely different subject. So one of the things that I thought was really interesting about the book, though, um, there's, there's that concept that people have had almost that surrounds, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth being a cursed play. A lot of people, for whatever reason, felt that The Crow was a cursed film. And without even going into the tragedy of, obviously, what happened to Brandon Lee, I was unaware that apparently somebody had caught fire on the set, a crew member. Uh, there was a hurricane that destroyed a big part of the set and delayed production that later even um, some sort of flood damaged film for the movie once it was finished. And for this reason, people still believe that there is some sort of curse surrounding The Crow as a project. W what do you think about that? I mean, you interviewed everybody, almost everybody that was there. Do you think it's just a series of terrible coincidences? There's, if you look at a lot of films, I mean, there's stuff that happens that we could make into more meaningful than others, you know, like, but mm -hmm. so I guess I'm always a skeptic or, a, you know, a bit circumspect about, you know, magnifying bad things that happen because there's a lot of good things that happen too. Everybody likes a conspiracy theory um they do I'm very good to correct all the shows have interviewed me i'm like uh maybe but it's all explainable so i don't know but i did ask myself and, and thank you for reading the book so carefully because there's was all those things that happened and even the people who i interviewed who worked on the film were like god not another thing this is like so uncanny and i think that that does have to give anyone or at least it gave me pause there's a lot of stuff that happened that was pretty hard to deal with 
Yeah. Um, although the natural disaster, I mean, the guy getting electrocuted, and all of them were totally explainable. It, it was just the backlot they hadn't used for a while. There were power lines. It was carelessness. It was also that there wasn't a lot of safety protocols. And so that's explainable totally. And then the storm was the storm, and they were shooting in this old cement factory, which was, I mean, and if you know, like, that part of Wilmington, North Carolina, I mean, it's like Storm Alley. So it was not crazy that there was a storm. So, I mean, everything is explainable and I tried to explain it. I mean, Brandon's death was, I mean, one in a, I, you know, I don't even want to say million, billion, I don't know, chance that all these, yeah. these components of what happened would have aligned. You know, I'm, I'm not a superstitious person, but the chances are very slim that this would have happened <laughs> extremely. Because there were many, many True. mistakes, many, many oversights that culminated in this terrible, and then the actual like physics of what happened were just so unlikely. I don't know. I mean, sometimes you think people do have people things, sometimes have trails of bad luck. History is full of it, right? It's true. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what to say, but I did have to, when I wrote the book, I read it over at the end. I'm like, I can explain it all because I have, but there's part of you that's like, wow. You know, maybe there is something more that I don't understand, but it does still give me pause. On the subject of, of that tragedy, because unfortunately you can't talk about The Crow without... You no, know, I mean, the film that... itself is like shaped by it, sadly. Um, yeah. So but most of the film was done. They only had like eight days left of shooting. <laughs> yeah. So they were done. Eight days film. left. When it comes to said tragedy, I had read a lot of different articles that were either incredibly sensationalized and gross or, you know, very vague. Um, I'd, I'd actually read several different misinterpretations of the incident and had, I mean, I've, I've been to the range enough times, I know how guns work, and I was like, somebody wrote this who doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. And when I read the book, I finally walked away with not just an understanding of the incident, but also you included first-hand accounts of the incident, like moment by moment, how it went down. And I think a year or two later now, after the incident on the set of Rust, do you think it's important in conversations about The Crow to continue to talk about that incident? Do you think it'll ever have an impact on gun safety? Because, I mean, after what happened to Helena Hutchins, we have questions, right? So I did, I had a much longer... I spent a lot more time than I ended up including in the book because I didn't want to take away from the purpose of the book, which was to write about mm -hmm. the making of the movie The Crow and its lasting impact as a, as a cultural classic in so many ways. But I think I have two minds about it. And I've talked a lot about, I've done interviews with various publications about the safety on sets. And somehow I was like suddenly drawn into like, oh, you're the expert on safety on set. I'm like, oh, not really actual armors of it, but you know, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> But basically sets are very safe. They're generally very, very safe. Considering mm -hmm. all the rounds of, you know, blanks that are fired, all the explosions that happen on movie sets. I think we live in a very safe environment for film production and television production, even though, you know, something happens that's really tragic and it, it like lights the spark of controversy. So the only similar accident for 30 years that happened, almost 30 years, was a fatality on set of a, a major person was the crow and then it was Russ. So that's a pretty yeah. good record overall. There are other accidents mm -hmm. that happen. I mean, stunt people have accidents that are not recorded. Crew members have accidents that are not recorded. So those don't make it to the media because they're not, they're not, you know, a tied to a celebrity that we can get. So uh, that's the media's fault. But so safety don't generally compared to all the rounds of ammo and explosions that happen and all the production that happens, mm -hmm is really, really good, generally. But mistakes do happen. And typically, you know, it, when you're in a low budget situation and you're outside a major film uh, production area. So if you're in North mm -hmm. Carolina, in Wilmington, North Carolina, or if you're in the desert with this really low budget film that they were making. I mean, The, the Crow in 1993 was 25 million. Rust was like 11 million two years ago. So I'm talking about ultra low yeah. budget movie, ultra low budget movies, so I'm like cutting corners and, and so many safety people I spoke to. And I did include that all kind of in the last, like 
afterward, the guidelines for make for handling firearms on any movie are the same as they were in 1993. If you follow them, you're totally safe. If you cut corners, which is one of the first things they told me that gets cut corners, of, of, you know, producers are going along and they're like, you know, we're going to be fine. We don't need the safety thing or whatever, you know, like we got to do the makeup and hair because that's people are going to see it. The chances of anything bad happening are small, but when they do happen, they're a big deal. It's, it's all about money. I guess that's what I said in the book was it's all about money. And, you know, if you only have statistics where, yeah, a major character in Brandon Lee in 1993 lost his life. And that was really tragic and terrible. And then we cut to rest like 30 years later. People were like, oh, well, this is producers are sitting back saying, well, generally we're pretty good. So this is not something we need to spend mm. money on. So I guess the film industry and any industry comes down to money. So I think that the awareness has gotten a lot better now, but I think technology is also creating a safer environment. Obviously, we could sit here and, and talk about that, that tragedy all day long, but I think one of the great things, and we kind of touched upon it earlier, was how special Brandon Lee as an individual was and the energy that he brought to the film. And you mentioned that you had spoken to close personal friends of his, his co-stars, would you say there's there's a common thread in conversations about him and his life, like something that you think stood out about him as a person? You know, I I never met him, but I knew I interviewed or knew enough people, even people I didn't always interview in the book that had nothing to do with the film. Independently, so many people who worked with him and knew him who decided to be honest with me and tell me. It, it was it was it was consistent. He was a genuinely kind, creative, gifted person, not only an actor, but I mean, he took a great part in writing the script. He was fun and a prankster, but just people loved him. I, I mean, their, their love for him just came through and not like, oh, well, you know, we loved him. It was like genuinely he resonated whether it was his, it was just who he was, I think. It was his charisma. You know, he had, he had had his trials in his life beforehand, um, you know, with his father's death and just living different places and, you know, rec finding himself, which I wrote. I, I think I just was struck by so many people told me similar. The feeling they gave me when they told me about him was so similar. I'm like, well, clearly this is true because all these people feel the same way about him in a way that was like really warm and obviously sad, but talked the same way, but he was just this really talented, kind, intelligent, creative spirit who people loved being around and people trusted. They trusted him actually. I never put that in the book, but they did. There was a certain, like he was just one of those people who you felt like he they, 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 they trusted him. They liked him. There was never anyone who said anything. And I don't think it's because of the trend. Nobody ever said anything negative. And I don't think it's because they were holding back because mm -hmm. in homage to whatever. I think it's because it was genuinely true. So it was a loss that that person is no longer with us on earth, whether he was going to be a star or not. I mean, you know, he was just genuinely like a great person. And I guess that made the tragedy even worse. So. Yeah, you really included so many beautiful anecdotes about him. I mean, you know, you can read this book cover to cover and walk away feeling like you knew the guy, which I think is such a complete and important way of telling the story. There's, you know, anecdotes. I remember a specific anecdote of him uh, startling people with a mouthful of uh, shaving cream, which I thought was so funny. I'd never thought that anybody would do something like that. And I think that that is a really important part of the book is that, you know, conversations surrounding him are so uh, often sensationalized and they want to focus on this tragedy. But I think his life, anybody's life, is worth so much more than their final moments. So I think, I think that that was a great thing to include in the book. So I think it's safe to say, um, in the earlier parts of the book, when they were thinking of casting Eric Draven, early on they mentioned names like Johnny Depp, Christian Slater, River Phoenix. I think, I think we're probably in agreement that The Crow might not have had the same impact had Brandon Lee not been the star. You know, it would have been different, right? It would have been all different. And, and the reason that they considered those actors 
before Brandon really, as they told me, and, and a lot of these stories, all these stories come from the people who I interviewed, Jeff Bosley, so many people. So again, mm-hmm. I am the deliverer of the information and, and trusting of their stories, but they were no names to the public. So that's why they considered them initially. And in some cases they were busy or they didn't want to pay or they asked to, you know, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why. And it just was inevitably they took a gamble on giving Brandon the role, mm-hmm. but it was clear to all of them that this is going to be an indie film and it's going to be like, he's the right person. So I guess it would have been a totally different, I guess it's hard to imagine, right? I mean, I just hope that I did write at the end of the book and I, you know, I genuinely feel this. I, I really, I lived in Seattle after I wrote the book and my daughter went to preschool, <laughs> like a half block from where he's buried. I was like, oh, this is so weird. And his father, he's buried next to his father. So I used to visit it sometimes. I was just like, I really hope that you liked the book and you felt it did justice. That's all I hoped. I felt, I hope you found it to be an honest, and I did write that book. I hope, I hope that you found it to be an honest chronicle of your experience. I really wanted to do that. I felt like after receiving all this information from people and the love people had, my like, my God, this person was a great person I don't know. I kind of feel like I know, but through osmosis, I just thought, I hope that he would be proud of, I hope he would feel it was accurate, okay? That's what I hope. <laughs> so in another world, in another universe, maybe, but um, I'm glad I got a chance to be the person to convey the story. It's quite an honor, honestly. No, and, and genuinely, I mean, I'm not even saying it just because I have you on here and I want to blow smoke, but genuinely, I mean, as somebody who has... I can't say lived and breathed it because I'm like a functioning person who has a life outside of the crow, obviously, but it has genuinely been like my great love. I have two shelves devoted to this. I watch it three times a year on Valentine's Day, my birthday, and Halloween, and if the weather is really rainy, I watch it then too. (laughs) Like, you know, it really is something that I have just loved for so long. And I'm going to ask another question here, and I'm not going to give my own input. People that have watched this channel know my thoughts on the reboot. That's not what this interview or video is about. Um, Public opinion, obviously, is pretty divided on it in general. Do you think that a reboot or remake, reimagining, whatever they want to call this, Do you think that it could bring new relevance to the original? Do you think that for people now that are seeing 1994, 30 years ago, it's a bygone era, I don't want to talk about 30 years ago, right? Do you think that this reboot, when people learn it's based on this, do you think it could give it a a new life, so to speak, a rebirth of the original? I think that that's what they're hoping for, obviously, um, at Pressman Films. I mean, not to be jaded about, you know, film companies love franchises. Um, (laughs) But, um, but that's just because I've been around the film business a while. But I I guess, you know, I hope so. It's a great story. If it does, great. Look, if the film, and I'm going to be perfectly honest with you about it, if the film is successful, you know, if it, it really is good in some way and resonates, then it will create some re-interest in the whole concept of the crow friend of the whole concept of the crow, the crow story and that would be great that'd be great it will be different than the first one though so it's like apples and oranges because as i understand it this new film is a reimagining it goes back to the source material james obara's graphic novel so mm-hmm. if it regenerates some interest in the story and the source material and then the idea of the story which is the same the idea of the human you know drama great if it doesn't do well then people will still want to read my book because they're like, oh, the original was really good. (laughs) So, I mean, you know, I guess, but I I can't compare them, right? You know, but if, yeah, it would be great. I mean, who doesn't like a good story? Selfishly, I hope that it's not just okay. (laughs) I hope it's either really not good or really, really good. Because that would be better because it would be more conclusive as opposed to being kind of like, eh. You know, it's like, okay, you know, but I I don't know. Again, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I've talked to, try not to let people who have seen it color my opinion. I think the jury is out and we'll see how it does. I think my best hope for it is that at the very least, regardless of what people think of it, I hope that more people hear the name, know the story, and will go back and refer to the original, regardless of if if the new one is good or not. I would just love to see 
a resurgence for this movie. So for me, I think it would just be so awesome to see society like reclaim this. Like if I showed up to a Comic Con and everybody was dressed as the crow again, I'd feel like I was in heaven. Like I just think that it that would be good. It would be cool. It would be so cool. And it's it's very authentic and it's deep, right? It's not like you know other characters that are fun but not. SD. I'm gonna bug you with one more question, okay? This is this is a 300 page masterpiece in my opinion. Well, Honestly, so I <laughs> I devoured this thing. It was a gift, and I opened it, and I was like, "Holy shit!" I did not even know this existed, and I sat there and I read it cover to cover. If you could choose one thing for people to take away from this book, what would what would it be? What do you want people to walk away? after they've read this book, what do you want them to take with them? Nobody's ever asked me that. That this was a magic piece of filmmaking history. That that little lightning in a bottle that happened, that I was so privileged to be, to discover and be, t- and be offered to publish a book about it and to be then like chronicle it, to really appreciate that little magic that happened in encapsulated in the making of this movie from the beginning of finding the graphic novel to it premiering until it lasting till today to for people to be curious about how does something like that happen and all appreciate all of the human creativity and care and love and pain and all the effort that went in that people told me who worked on this movie in one way or another, again, independently said it was the best and the worst times of their life. They really were also dedicated to what they were trying to create to realize that life has its tragedies and its triumphs. And, you know, this is a a good example of that. I guess to appreciate the magic that was lightning in that bottle. It strikes people on a very, very deep human level. And that's what art and filmmaking and everything is about. Right. If we can all experience that in other parts of our lives, then that's the reason to be here, I guess. So lightning in a bottle. I think that is the perfect way to describe this movie. I hope y'all enjoyed that interview, watching it as much as I enjoyed doing it. There are a few things that make me happier to talk about than the crow and It was such a pleasure and such an honor to get Bridget Bass, who, again, is the messenger of so many people who were on that set, who worked on The Crow, who had a love for the source material, the film, everything. I am so beyond grateful that my first time having a guest on this channel was somebody like Bridget Bass, who has not just spent years being a dedicated journalist and broadcast journalist, but also somebody who is so connected to the source material and genuinely appreciates it and wrote such a phenomenal book. If you didn't catch the title, the 30th anniversary re-release is The Crow, The Life, Death, and Rebirth of a Classic Film. You can get it pretty much anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. I'm gonna add links to those in the description below. And that's all from me. I've been Snarky J. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. For more Snarky J, tune in on Twitch every Tuesday and Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. EST. You can also check out my Instagram. And if you'd like to support me, this channel, and my content creation, do check out and consider subscribing to my Patreon for exclusive photo shoot sets and content. I will add links to all of those in the description below. And let me know your thoughts on this very special video about 1994's The Crow in the comments below.